We're an urbanised society in Britain. In fact, in most of the world now, people are urbanised. What I find when people from urban centres come in here is there's a passivity in their engagement. I can see it on their faces. They're walking through this landscape and they're not engaging in it with any depth because they don't know what they're looking at. So they can't see the beauty, they can't see the diversity, they can't see the wonder. And if you can't see those things, then when that's under threat, it's very difficult for them to care, right? What I've created here, this is slowly becoming the Blackmore Vale 15,000 years ago. That's what species need. All the species that we have alone in England, this is their home. I think rewilding has an ability to reconnect people with nature. You come here and you see the complexity. My very early experiences with nature, it was sort of Huckleberry Finn a bit, you know, it was this sort of very visceral, hands-on, just total freedom. We really would leave the house after breakfast with our Ealing lines, and the deal was you have to be back for dinner. If you think about what that was, the interaction we self-educated, was sort of paradise, you know. I grew up on a farm three hours north of Auckland on gravel roads, and all my family farmed. Everybody in New Zealand farmed there. And we'd slaughter our own animals. It was horrendous to watch. When we did it on the farm, Dad would always take the animal up and put it in the cow shed. And it would be separate from the rest of the cows. I've got these memories of the animals being on their own. My brother and I had a neighbour called Ben Roberts. One night, Ben slaughtered an animal in the yard with other animals. There was a bull on the other side of the fence and the bull went off its nut, pouring the ground and bellowing, which added another whole complexity to the sort of psychodrama. There was something completely visceral about that. We never slaughtered animals on the farm like that. It felt sort of wrong. They're not stupid, you know. These are relatively intelligent mammals, aren't they? And I've often thought about that time. All I ever wanted to be as a kid was a farmer. It's the only thing I ever wanted to be was a dairy farmer. And Dad was going to sell the farm, we were going to buy a bigger farm. The whole thing was completely mapped out. At 13, it was in reach. I got hurt at rugby. And so we were packed off to a doctor in Auckland. I remember just verbatim what he said, looking at my parents, not at me, this boy will never be a farmer. And we saw the farm. I was just completely blown apart. I remember the drive home, just inconsolable. My life suddenly had no meaning. Everything I'd imagined and dreamed of as a young child had gone. What I do remember very specifically then was imagining a new future and how bloody torturous that was. It was really fraught, really, 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 really fraught. Deeply problematic. I left school, I failed at university, I slightly cobbled together a sort of a diploma for teaching. I think I was sort of completely rudderless for the next 20 years. I always wanted to prove myself and I'm not quite sure who to. But there was probably an insecurity there. I've just been everything, been a cook, a fisherman, an accountant. We also had Barcelona and, and I was teaching English and fishing. I was taken a couple of times to bullfights, which I just found really difficult. Really, really difficult. It was a complete brutality to their death, which was like, whoa, and an unfairness in their death. They have these things called picadors, and they disable the bull. They sever a whole lot of muscles along its flank to then slow the bull down. And it's really long, it's really torturous, just as a slow, excruciating. I like going and watching a rugby game. They're all rammed in there. And I remember they're just glee at this thing. 
this horror that was unfolding over the slow death of this animal. Me just sitting there going, Jesus Christ, this is like the worst horror movie I've ever been to. And I just could never reconcile that. I had recurring dreams then about bulls and death. Bulls with no skin left on. So just raw flesh. They were always in, a, in some sort of fight. The interesting thing, it was always us and the bull, human and the bull. It's the way we treat animals. We treat them with complete disrespect. There's a sentientness in them. There's a cognition in them. They're working stuff out. They're thinking, they're looking. I went back to university and became the organisational psychologist and then worked my butt off doing that job. I think after doing that for 15 years, it lost its interest. I'd stopped caring and if you don't care, you can't do. But I just really stopped all my work and had some fairly painful conversations with people about, sorry, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I then took a year sabbatical. Like, there's got to be an answer out there, man. There's got to be something, you know. It was quite difficult trying to answer that question. The next sort of thought process was, OK, what do I start doing out there that's going to make a difference? I understood that if you worked with the land in a particular way, you could bring all these species in. Thinking, if I can buy a piece of land, I could do a rewilding project. Underhill Wood was on the market. It was going to go to auction. And I saw the barn and I just thought, man, this is it. In my mind, this is what I've been looking for. And it's interesting, the vision I had back then is exactly where it is now. For me, it was like you can buy a small piece of land and you can have an effect. And this is not vanity. You can do things. I think if people understood the natural world better, they would then be thinking about their impact. If you spend time here and you start deepening your knowledge of ecology, you begin to understand that there's a multiplicity of things that are wrong. Kids go to school and learn about kings and queens and the Tudors, and they haven't got a clue what's going on here now. They just don't have the language. So they can't see because they've not been taught to see. The education program here is switching these kids on. And it's interesting, I don't talk to them about the crisis that's off the agenda, we don't go there. It's much more a process of hope and engagement and wonder because I want them to go away from here sort of buzzing. It's amazing what happens here in this tiny little bit of land. And you then think, what would happen if we scaled that, if 30% of the planet was a no-go nature zone? The motivations for this are very different. It's not about me, it's about them pushing myself to understand the ecology so it's conducive to them. I don't want it for me, I'm not proving anything to anybody anymore. What I'm doing this for is I want these guys to have a life, to live out their lives in safety.